as opposed to just exposing, because we all have this program where we think all we have to do is talk about a problem and the morality police are going to come out of the woodwork and fix it. I'd like everybody here to know today that the Citizens Committee for Restructured Government, ccrg.info, Charlie Charlie, RomeoGolf.info is the website. It'll explain uh, more specifically the issue that I'm about to present, but uh, there is no doubt about it, the Department of Defense is involved. Uh, we will also send anybody that requests it a copy of a Department of Defense briefing that took place regarding utilizing chemtrails to spray certain viral matter into our environment, which would be absorbed by people to uh, manipulate certain parts of proper functioning of the brain. There are also record numbers of respiratory and health related issues out there. I'm sure somebody in this room knows somebody that's having some type of sinusitis, bronchitis. Uh, it is a reaction, to the allergic re uh, it's an allergic reaction to what's being done to us. They are spraying, there is no doubt about it. DOD is involved, and as I mentioned, I can't stress enough to contact us and request a copy of the Department of Defense briefing uh, that basically they admit, flat out, some very interesting things as well as uh, I believe there was an assassin uh, at, you know, present during that briefing who asks a very interesting question, which uh, is also again depicted in the video. Uh, also, a lot of people here are familiar with something called Project HARP, High Altitude Auroral Research Project. The same scientist, Dr. Bernard Eastland, who has certain patent involvement with HARP, uh, also has patent involvement with the elements that are being sprayed in the chemtrails. Also, my question uh, is, to pe for people to ponder, is who has the kind of power to allow jet fuel to be infused with aluminum, barium, and other toxic elements and authorized to refuel air airplanes with this toxic substance and spray them systematically all over the world? Uh, the two countries that are not being hit are Sub-Sahara Africa and China. What a coincidence, um, is not receiving the amount of chemtrail exposure that the rest of the world is. But is it a fact? Yes. Is it happening? Yes. Are people going to get up here today and present all this evidence and information on how it's being done and all these other things? Yes. But I want people to remember that when you want solution to not just the chemtrail issue, uh, we have a way of taking our country off of oil. We can reverse many illnesses through techniques that are not being discussed by the AMA. Um, if anybody here is on fluoride, please look up a case. Dr. William Marcus versus the EPA. Chief toxicologist of the EPA was fired from his job in 96 that exposing that fluoride is toxic. So if anybody wants legal proof that fluoride is toxic, there's the copy of the lawsuit. Dr. William Marcus versus the EPA. Uh, the, the, the Fluoride has been approved in our drinking water and various other uh, substances, our toothpaste. So this is one atrocity that again ties into the same entities that are not only authorizing fluoride and other chemical, biological, and electronic manipulations of our reality and health, uh, but it's the legal documentation that backs it all up. And everybody wants proof, proof, proof. We got all the proof you can imagine. A lot of people here are going to present proof. But when you want solution, I want people to think ccrg.info. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Uh, Cynthia McCullis. and I'm with Long Island Skywatch. Um, Geoengineering is defined as actions taken to counter the climate effects of greenhouse gas emissions on the atmosphere. Current research is focused on two distinct concepts. The most discussed technique is solar radiation management, which is also known as SRM. SRM releases particles, known as aerosols, into the atmosphere. The purpose is to increase the amount of solar energy or sunlight that is reflected back to space. 
The second technique alters the reflectivity of clouds by spraying droplets of seawater into the atmosphere to make the clouds brighter. There are many patents that describe how these two concepts are accomplished. In 1990, Hughes Aircraft Company created the Wellsback Seating Patent for the Reduction of Global Warming. The patent describes putting metals like aluminum and barium into jet fuel. Then, water vapor from the jet engine seeds the atmosphere by creating particles that stay afloat to reflect sunlight. Geoengineering would only mask the effects of climate change. In fact, geoengineering adds a greenhouse gas more potent than CO2 to the atmosphere, water vapor. It also does nothing to decrease or prevent rising CO2 and the resulting problems such as ocean, ocean acidification. Geoengineering would also significantly increase acid rain. Acid rain leaches aluminum from soil into rivers and streams and damage, damages fish populations by disrupting their reproductive cycle. Acid rain from sulfur, nitrogen, and aluminum greatly impacts highly sensitive forest ecosystems. It damages forests by draining nutrients from the soil, which causes altered tree growth and dieback. I would advise everyone to start looking at the trees on Long Island. They are in severe decline. A tree bark sample taken from my backyard showed high aluminum, barium, and strontium. Acid rain causes aluminum to be unnaturally released from the soil. As aluminum is the favored metal being proposed by geoengineers due to its low cost, the effects on Long Island forests, farms, and waters is insurmountable. Geoengineering, which also includes weather modification and weather mitigation programs, could decrease rainfall significantly. Decreased rainfall would have a huge agricultural impact on Long Island's farming community, trees, water supplies, and citizens. Geoengineering could also increase rain or snow in one area to the detriment of another. It would reduce the total amount of direct sunlight reaching Earth's surface. All plants, agricultural crops, and trees require direct sunlight for photosynthesis, let alone humans. The decrease in sunlight over the oceans could affect precipitation patterns, leading to crazy weather. Geoengineering would decrease effectiveness of alternative forms of energy, such as solar panels, due to reductions in direct sunlight or diffuse sunlight. Geoengineering would also increase atmospheric water vapor, a greenhouse gas, and cirrus clouds which are formed from the trails which are left by the plains. They spread out, block the sun, and turn our sky into a white haze, which is what we get quite frequently on Long Island. Aircraft emissions are responsible for 4 to 8 percent of global warming since air temperature records began in 1850. So the panacea they are proposing is actually causing what they are purporting to fix. It doesn't compute. Aircraft are considered the most economical way to disperse atmospheric aerosols into the atmosphere. However, rockets are used all the time. In 2009, the U.S. Navy and NASA dispersed an aluminum oxide dust cloud using a rocket over the east coast of the United States. Where was their environmental impact statement or public oversight? Geoengineering also raises particularly difficult national security issues because it could help some regions while harming others. All studies show that once begun, it cannot be stopped without creating harmful sudden increases in global temperature. Who decides when and where to geoengineer? Why is there no public consent to our government dropping aluminum, barium, silver iodide, or other aerosols into the air we breathe? As a teacher for 16 years, I have watched disabilities rise among my students exponentially. Ten years ago, autism was one out of every 10,000 children. Now it affects one in 70 boys. Allergies are no longer seasonal. They last all year and they develop at any age. Nearly everyone you know has a child with a disability. Asthma is an epidemic. Respiratory illness is the third leading cause of death. It has moved up from seven in the last six years. Something is causing this. You're out of time. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon everybody. My name is pronounced Siobhan Cerisi. I am here representing Long Island Skywatch. My question is, do we want our Earth and atmosphere to remain intact as a life support system, or do we want it to be a physics laboratory for military and private interests? Complete with global dimming due to sunlight reduction, soil pH changes, Increasing water and air pollution, reduced vitamin D production, human health decline. Siobhan, I gotta interrupt you. Yes. The signs have to disappear. Okay. Okay. Those are. This is not cutting into my time right now, is it? Yes, your clock is running. Okay. Well, 
well. I get an extra 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, so lower crop production, dead and dying trees, photosynthesis problems, and the list goes on. This is the choice we are faced with as humans, and modifying the atmosphere, and whether intentionally through geoengineering and unintentionally through aviation and pollution. I am here today in support of IR 2029, a local law to protect air quality in Suffolk County, which places restrictions on the intentional disbursement of barium, sulfur, salts, and aluminum oxide into the air. These chemicals listed in Mr. Romaine's proposal are currently being promoted for geoengineering solar radiation management schemes on a global level and are referred to in numerous United States patents for weather modification technologies and methods dating as far back as the 1930s. What is geoengineering? According to the 2009 Royal Society report titled Geoengineering, Science, Governance, and Uncertainty, it is the, quote, deliberate large-scale manipulation of the planetary environment to counteract anthropogenic climate change. Geoengineering proposals aim to intervene in the climate system by deliberately modifying the Earth's energy balance, end quote. Geoengineering, also referred to as climate remediation, weather modification, and solar radiation management, is already underway in the United States according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the United States Navy and NASA, and several other countries including Germany, India, Russia, and the UK, who are exploring or, quote, moving ahead with their own climate remediation efforts, according to the 2011 Bipartisan Policy Center's Task Force on Climate Remediation. Between 2009 and 2010, the U.S. House Committee on Science and Technology held hearings discussing the implications of large-scale climate intervention, the scientific basis and engineering challenges, and domestic and international research governance. These are the titles of their meetings. As discussions about geoengineering have already taken place at the federal level of government, likewise, this reality needs to be discussed by the local levels of government and public hearings made available. Being that geoengineering affects the planetary climate and weather patterns, the public at the local levels must have the ability to accept or reject such experiments and programs in their own communities. According to John Holdren, director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, quote, there are a variety of schemes that have been discussed for geoengineering. A classic example is injecting reflecting particles into Earth orbit, end quote. It is these programs which I will be addressing today. Solar Radiation Management, or SRM, involves deliberate inject deliberately injecting particles, chemicals, or gases into our upper atmosphere to decrease the amount of direct sunlight reaching the Earth to mask or reverse the effects of climate change. These schemes include cloud whitening experiments using salts and other particulates, injecting metal oxides into the atmosphere, and putting more water vapor, a potent greenhouse gas, into the atmosphere to create man-made artificial clouds. SRM models include stratospheric sulfate injections and the spraying of 10 to 20 million tons of aluminum oxide and other aerosols into our atmosphere for the stated goal of cooling the planet, as documented at the American Association for the Advancement of Science Conference in 2010. According to the Bipartisan Task Force on Climate Remediation Research, quote, although SRM may be able to mask some impacts of greenhouse gases on the climate system, it would do nothing to deal with the chemical consequences of increased CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, end quote. This can be likened to suppressing symptoms of an illness while not addressing the root causes. Thus, the system remains sick, but the illusion of wellness is what we get. Simultaneously, we are in the midst of a global dimming. In 2003, NASA scientists reported that the Earth is 20% darker. A report issued by the International Osteoporosis Foundation in 2009 showed that populations across the, gro the globe are suffering from the impact of low levels of vitamin D. The problem is widespread and on the increase, with potentially severe repercussions for overall health and fracture rates. Aluminum is a neurotoxin in humans. Prolonged exposure can impair cognitive function and lead to motor dysfunction. Barium salts are very toxic and, if ingested, have a strong stimulating effect on all muscles, including the heart. Excessive barium poisoning can lead to vomiting, diarrhea, convulsive tremors, and increased blood pressure, according to the EPA. According to our own New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, high concentrations of sulfates can enter the cardiovascular respiratory systems, resulting in disease or even death and leach metals from soils in the form of acid rain. Ultimately, geoengineering affects all of us, and thus information needs to be made widely available to the public, public and programs voted on by the public before the implementation of any such schemes. Thank you. Our blue skies are no longer the deep blue of our youth. It is usually crossed with trails that go in directions that are against FAA standard flight plans. I have called the FAA and Homeland Security numerous times only to be told it's not their jurisdiction. 
As you can see from the cover of Packet 2, the trails are now being put into media, books, video games, movies, and always behind the weathermen on the news. These trails have become normal to everyone, especially our children. To make sure of this, NASA has implemented a Count the Contrail program in the 1980s, which was distributed to the elementary schools in the United States. In this way, children grew up thinking these trails were normal. There are patents to make different kinds of clouds on the books. The clouds we see today do not fall into previous classifications. In fact, NASA made new classifications for clouds last year. The United Nations implemented a ban on geoengineering in 2010. 190 nations agreed, except for the United States and the United Kingdom. Congress has had three meetings on geoengineering in 2010. The Council of Foreign Relations, which is a private entity, sponsored a meeting on unilateral, unilateral geoengineering in 2008. The U.S. Senate bill was introduced in 2009 titled Weather Mitigation Research and Development Pos Policy Authorization Act. A weather mitigation bill has been introduced every year since 2005. In 2009, the United Kingdom Royal Society put forth a study titled Geoengineering the Climate, Science, Governance, and Uncertainty. The Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology had a meeting on geoengineering research in 2009. Just last week, a United Nations climate conference in South Africa on Friday said that in theory, reflecting a small amount of sunlight back into space before it strikes the Earth's surface would have an immediate and dramatic effect. But nobody knows what the side effects would be, and they could unintentionally change weather patterns and rainfall. There continue to be many meetings sponsored by corporations that stand to gain from geoengineering. There was the Asilomar Conference in 2009 about strategies, monies, and governance of climate intervention. The meeting consisted of only corporations. There are currently 69 weather modification programs in the United States with no oversight. A weather form can be submitted to NOAA by localities. Texas has a weather modification law, number 301, on the books. The requirement to obtain a license to implement weather modification is pay the license fee, and demonstrate to the satisfaction of the department competence in the field of meteorology to engage in weather modification and control activities. Many countries around the world have weather modification programs. There is no control or oversight anywhere. In September of this year, the United Kingdom was going to simulate an artificial volcano by releasing sulfur into the atmosphere through a balloon-type contraption. This is just one experiment that was made public. It was halted due to public reaction. What about the other experiments that the public is unaware of? Weather modification corporations are now a multi-billion dollar business. They're on the web. One such company is called Weather Modification Incorporated, and its motto is, some people see clouds, we see potential. Another company would be JustClouds.com. Weather derivatives have turned into have turned weather into a tradable commodity since 1997. It is an $8 billion a year business. Monsanto has created aluminum resistant crops. Unless our plan, uh, why, why would they need to, why would they have a need for aluminum resistant crops unless our plants can't grow due to the increase of aluminum in our soil? There are calls once again to globally ban geoengineering at the United Nations Conference in June 2012. This is not enough. Over the last few years, we've seen record rain and snowfalls, droughts, heat waves, tornadoes, and hurricanes just on Long Island alone. All of, the, all of these weather anomalies mimic the consequences of the geoengineering schemes that are being proposed by governments and corporations. The true question is who stands to profit by blaming these weather anomalies on global warming? Certainly it is not Long Island. The true cause of climate change is being engineered right above our heads. Thank you for your time. Anthony DeRosco, Anthony DeRosco. On deck is Theo Phalaris. 
Hi, I'm a resident of Huntington. I've been living in Suffolk County for the last since 2002. And um, as far as the spraying, I didn't even wasn't aware of the spraying until someone pointed it out to me about five years ago. He said, "Look in the sky." And since I they pointed out the trails, I, I see them every day. <clears throat> My concern is they're spraying them up at about 30,000 feet. Whoever is um, spraying them um, is not being, they're not responsible and they're not accountable for the, uh, where, the, where, where they're falling and the, the consequences to us are, there are basically four different consequences. One is economic consequences. Decreased sunlight means um, less healthy crops, trees are dying, uh, vegetation is not as healthy, and there's less production for crops. That's one of the economic consequences. The second economic consequence is decreased energy for solar panels. And the next consequence is health. Levels of di vitamin D are uh, decreasing. Um, vitamin D is essential for your health. And unknown con consequences, which the three uh, people that were very knowledgeable just spoke about. Aluminum, barium, and heavy metal salts. No, one, no one's filed an, an environmental impact statement, so how do we know what the, the impact is uh, on our health? Um, the third, third um, issue is global warming. Uh, which actually is controversial because we're not sure it even exists because we have these aluminum particles that are being sprayed in the air, they deflect the sun. So what happens is the sun is not, the, the, the right amount of sun is not hitting the earth and then the heat is getting trapped. So it's actually being, global warming is actually a man-made concept. We, need, we really need to pass this legislation. It's everyone should take a look up in the sky and educate themselves. There's a lot of research being done on this. and. The, uh, they should file an environmental impact statement and prove that they're safe before they continue to spray. Your children, they're, they're, everyone here, if you have children, if you have pets, if you have your own health yourself, it's your, you're responsible for um, safeguarding your health. And it's not being safeguarded. There's no environmental impact statement. There's no, no one keeping track of the impact on your health from the spraying. And it's being done every single day. And the last issue is: is it, a, is it a constitutional issue? How can it be constitutional to spray on you, spray, do aerial spraying, and, and drop heavy metals when it's actually taking your property? It's taking your liberty. It's taking your right to happiness. I'm a lawyer by trade, and that's what I've been doing for 20 years. So, if anyone needs any legal research, I'm giving it to you for free on this issue because this, to me, is the most important issue in the world facing every one of you. Your life depends upon it. They take it seriously, please. I, 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 I've written letters to senators, congressmen. This to me is the most important issue for all of you, for your health, for your children. And that's it. Thanks, <laughs> okay. um, you. And uh, my daily experience when I drive around and I go to Montauk, to Southampton, is that when airplanes, they enter Montauk, they turn off their, their aerosol spray, and they spray up to Southampton, and then they stop. And the patterns that I see, they are cross axis, and uh, the spray is heavy, and goes on every day. Uh, several years ago, I was walking with a friend of mine about a mile in the morning, every morning, and I witnessed a very heavy spraying that month of January, and I got scared, and I didn't walk anymore. But my friend continued walking. This person has a very robust health. He's a very strong and healthy person. She came down with a case of persistent bronchitis for two months and I couldn't save it with antibiotics or anything. So uh, there is no absolute proof there, but there is evidence that there is something bad happening there. And also I would like to say that men can live without food for about 60 days, without water for about 12 days, but without air he can live. <laughs> Five minutes.
unfortunately, as an immigrant, I came 40 years ago in this country because I believed in the ideals of this country. And now I see that we have turned everything upside down. And it's a grotesque example of what used to be the United States. Yeah. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. Jennifer Jager, Jennifer Jager. I want to open up with what I, my favorite uh, bumper sticker states. If you're not pissed off, then you're not paying attention. Yeah. That is true. <laughs> so yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. For those who don't know, for those who don't believe, I want to describe what has happened. This, by the way, started about 20 years ago, but today it can't go unnoticed. I would like to ask everyone to just look up, pay attention to the skies in the morning, throughout the day, and into the evening. On certain days, you will notice nothing but other days you will can see these planes that are at least 33,000 feet up in the air. Sometimes you might see more than one of these planes in the sky at once. In 2006, my wife and I noticed four or five planes flying east to west from our first home in Riverhead. My wife and I see as they were flying that they started the persistent contrails and stopped it when they wanted because the planes would still be in the same elevation but no persistent contrails. That was uh, just very disturbing. I had called my senators, congressmen, and U.S. Health Department. You will notice that this persistent contrail that goes from one horizon to the other, sometimes they are short, sometimes they are behind clouds. They sometimes create X's and other times they grid like patterns. They eventually expand throughout the day by covering this whole sky which then look like cirrus clouds. Cirrus clouds appear to be white and light gray in color. They form when water vapor undergoes deposition at altitudes of 16,500 feet in temperate regions and above 20,000 feet in tropical regions, which uh, is why they are not cirrus clouds. I know when I was growing up as a kid, there was no such thing, what I call sky graffiti or sky pollution. There are these nanoparticles of aluminum, barium, strontium falling from the skies because people are finding them extremely high levels in ponds, lakes, and soil. My family has found that we have high aluminum when we were tested for heavy metals. My wife and I had 11, my children had a 10, but the CDC says that the safe range is zero through nine. When I had the chelation done, which is a process that can go through to remove heavy metals, which is expensive because medical insurance doesn't cover, my numbers went up instead of going down. That's because the aluminum was pulled out of the fatty tissues or the cells where it was stored. What is really scary, could they be dropping anything else upon us? There is a disease called Morgellons, which came out in the 90s, and there is documentation out there that explains that in depth. It's believed that synthetic polymer fibers that are being dropped, which are catalyzed by the metals in the air. A.C. Griffith was an associate within the NSA, and he carried top secret clearance and a cryptographic uh, clearance. In his more recent times, he's associated with CIA operations. On May 14, 2007, he was interviewed on a program called the Power Hour. He stated that Wright-Patterson Air Force Base was where it had been managed. Uh, we know that the people have died over this program, he said, and one of the key people that designed aerosol, barium salt aerosol, was set up by people in the Reagan administration, and he is now sitting in a federal penitentiary. They are still going to him to ask him questions, but yet he is still in prison. It, that is a little unnerving, isn't it? That the man that has designed the barium salt aerosol is still is sitting in prison? The trails, white trails that are not coming out of the engines, it's coming out of aerosol units on the aircraft. The name of the project is Project Cloverleaf, and in the air industry, it's very secretive. Project Cloverleaf was initiated to allow commercial airlines to assist in the releasing of these chemicals into the atmosphere. Airline companies in America have been participating in something called Project Cloverleaf for some years now. In 1998 and 1999, airline employees have been being briefed on it. A few airline employees who were briefed on the Project Cloverleaf were all made to undergo background checks, and before they were briefed on it, they were made to sign on non-disclosure agreements, which basically state that if they were to tell anyone, they would know they would be imprisoned. My final statement, everyone needs to wake up, start paying attention. There is more to the persistent contrails than the public knows. The military has lots of reasons, especially scalar weapons, and they don't want the public to know. 
So the best way to convince the public nothing out of the ordinary is to tell them the people are conspiracy theorists. As time goes on, and it's, it's going to be harder for them to hide the truth. Thank you very much, and thank you for everybody coming. I want to congratulate this body for having this hearing and uh, legislate, legislator Romaine for introducing this bill. Uh, looking at Occupy Wall Street, we find that the people are finally speaking up to things that we know are wrong. Uh, we have bills in local communities to get rid of corporate personhood. Uh, because this is the only way that, we, that the people are going to have a voice, is to start at the grassroots in, in, in our towns and appeal to our local legislators to do something about, about terrible problems like this ge geoengineering. Um, I'm a photographer and a gardener. And I, both advocations are suffering because of geoengineering. It used to be out here the light. The, the South Fork was known for its light. The beautiful, beautiful, clear light. Well, that clear light is gone. All we have is haze. We'll have a beautiful day and the geoengineering will start, you'll see the trails in the sky, and then the afternoon looks like it does today. And um, Long Island is not also known for its agriculture. We're, the, I believe, the first or second biggest agricultural county in the state. Um, the obvious loss of sunlight is affecting the agriculture. I know in my own garden, um, my crops are diminishing year after year. Um, our health is being ruined. Uh, we don't know what's in the, the trails. And I appeal to our legislators to ask some questions for us. Yeah. Where, where are the planes coming from? Are they coming from Gabriski? Are they coming from another state? Um, who's ordering them? We need to know. We deserve to know. Um, our health and the viability of this county is, is at stake. And we, the people, will prevail. John Mignogna. Selden. Followed by John Zito. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you, Ed Romano. You know what this woman said. This legislation is very important that has been brought forth. So please help us stop the chemical spraying and support this ban. The people of New York need to demand a public investigation of the chemical spraying that's going on right here in our backyard. Introduce a legislation to create a no chemical spraying zone here in New York, Long Island. immunity and protection to anyone willing to come forward to blow the whistle on this chemtrail operation. Wow. Yeah. We need to boycott the products and any companies who produce the chemical related products. Yeah. Identify those who are responsible for allowing us to be sprayed to uh, our city, our county, our state, as well as the global level. We need to demand uh, that each city be given any 72-hour warning before spraying, say, for a West Nile virus or something like that. But we, that day should be given notice, which I think they have. <coughs> we need to demand uh, an explanation for the chemical spraying. And we need to prosecute anyone, anyone, who continues to aid these illegal chemical operations and hold those companies responsible that produce the toxic chemicals and metals and biological toxins and any other submicron particles that may cause chemical-related diseases that affect the general population. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we all have families here and children. And like it was just said, this has to be done at the local level. This will be the first ban of chemical trail uh, spraying, chemical <coughs> trail spraying in the United States. So this report. <laughs> so this is essential that you act and support the ban that Ed Romain has courageously stepped forward with. So I ask you all, please, in your conscience, pray to your God or your gods and direct you and help keep us free from this tyranny. My friends, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. John Zito followed by uh, Janice uh, Barcelo. Good afternoon, everybody. And I wanted to say thank you very much for giving me your attention. I'm not gonna speak long. I know you folks are listening to a lot of stuff up here and a lot of it may be new, a lot of it may be not. I have six children. In this day and age, that's an anomaly all of itself. And I can imagine their lives in the future and I believe they've been gifted to me. Uh, just let me say that I don't do this very often, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm amused at, at the number of people that aren't actually paying attention. And yeah. it's Mr. Zito, address the audience. Don't say them all, right? This, you're about the 12th speaker on this subject, so please continue with your presentation. I say that with all due respect. I can imagine their lives in the future, and I, I know that you folks have children and relations. There are challenges. We have systematic breakdowns that are happening. But without getting, without getting too much fear base into it, I can imagine for you standing here, sitting here, listening to us all talk, that reaching up 30,000 feet and identifying yourselves with something that's happening way up there it can be a little daunting. The good thing is that there's actually been a lot of research done. And at this point, we are pretty clear that there are chemicals being used that are really deadly. The scientists are good, I'll give them that. They can make an amazing amount of things happen up in the stratosphere. If, listen, if they're trading snowfall on the stock exchange, they better be good. Aluminum is highly deadly. Mount Shasta, previously known as pristine, about as pristine a region in the United States as we get. 61,000 parts per million aluminum in the soil in the last five years. 61,000. The government has said, the federal government has said that 1,000 parts per million is a toxic ceiling. That's 61 times. There's enough video clips and audio clips and media print on record at this time that I don't think there's an argument whether or not this is happening. We know it's happening. It's no longer trying to convince people that those go or don't go or stay or whatever they do. <laughs> the, the question now is that every time officials are petitioned from the federal government to the state level, there has been denial. I traveled from Hartford, Connecticut to come here because this is the first time that I've been able to address a group of officials that will listen. And 
and I am so grateful. So we've been denied from the top down. I beg that each of you consider the constituency that you represent. And man, you are in a tough place. Because there's a lot of really outspoken mavens in this audience. <laughs> I beg that you consider just the facts. All the other stuff, just set it aside and just listen to the facts. If you don't have them, I can make them available to you. Or probably anybody here. <laughs> Listen to what those facts are and make a decision so that a precedent is set so we can start to move forward. Thank you. And this is an issue I've done a lot of research on. I would just like to respectfully request that you think about your families, your friends. This is not a Republican issue. This is not a Democrat issue. This is an issue of the general welfare of the American people. Thank you. We had an 85-year-old woman strip searched by the TSA at JFK Airport last week, and we have no idea who is spraying us with what. We have an idea of with what, but we don't have any idea really who is flying these planes. And the average law-abiding citizen can't even get on a plane without being harassed. This is insanity. The science behind the argument is sound. Anybody with a functioning set of eyes, a critical thinking process, that, that has spent any significant amount of time re reviewing this evidence could see it as sound. And it's clearly the will of the people that's educated on this matter that an end is put to this. Please give us the unanimous decision to pass this bill so that we can show the world that America's taking freedom back and we're not going to be sprayed like a bunch of bugs. a lot of other speakers, so I would like the rest of the time to be reserved for them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pauline, followed by Greg Fisher. Hello, I'm Pauline Cantwell from Greenwich, Connecticut, and I came out today because I have been concerned about it, this issue for many years. I have worked at the UN since 94, leading the Peace Caucus there, and getting involved in the weaponization of weather, weather as a weapon, and got interested in the geoengineering issue, which has been covered by the UN for a long time. In fact, they passed a, a convention banning the hostile manipulation of weather in 1978. I have five grandchildren on Long Island, and children living here. I'm concerned about their health, I'm concerned about the health of people all over the world. I started doing a radio show in Greenwich, Memorial Day of last year. My theme song is Blue Skies by Willie Nelson. <laughs> and I want my blue skies back. I want to wake up and see the blue skies when I get up, and I want to see them when I go, when I see the sunset at night. I'm tired of seeing the desert sunsets in Greenwich, Connecticut. We shouldn't be having bright red sunsets in Greenwich. Um, I was in Texas early November. I met with George Lomar, who heads up the weather modification program there. I had him on my radio show November 15th. November 22nd, I talked about some of it on November 15th. Those shows are archived at www.wgch.com. We talked about a program in Mexico by a Russian weather modification company, Elot Technologies doing ionization of weather, doing uh, rain enhancement and precipitation denial. And we talked about a military corporation, <coughs> Sky Blue, who came to Texas and got a, a permit. They said they were former military. They got a permit to alter the weather using laser technology. And then they disappeared this year. They, they can't be found. Um, and the only thing we can find is Sky Blue, which is a Space Technology Corporation in Colorado. I went to the Bonn Conference in Germany 
and distributed Rosalind Peterson's flyers. I have Rosalind Peterson, California Skywatch, on my show almost every week. And I distributed these geoengineering flyers. Octopus on one side strangling the earth, and the scientist on the other side saying, just trust us, we're going to put all these chemicals up, and it's going to be okay. And it shows the CARE <laughs> rocket, C-A-R-E, Charged Aerosol Released Experiment. That rocket went over my house in Greenwich, September 9th, 19, uh, two years ago, 19th, September 19th. My next door neighbor thought it was a UFO. It was spraying mm -hmm. aluminum oxide and was seen by a cruise ship. Maybe some of you saw it go over your house. It was launched from Wallop Island, Virginia to create NASA lucent clouds. These are being done deliberately. Um, I was taken out of the conference, told I couldn't distribute this flyer anymore. It wasn't authorized. And then I was told the next day it was a case of mistaken identity. It was no case of mistaken identity because I brought Roswell on as a keynote speaker in 07 at the Climate Change Conference and we did a program on geoengineering, weather warfare, and all these issues and they know what I'm talking about and they didn't want it discussed. So I, I, I applaud all the people here. I am so impressed. I have been a lone person in the wilderness at these conferences, and I am really impressed by people's knowledge and their concern. There is a history of military spraying diseases on people. You can check out the book Clouds of Secrecy uh, by Leonard Cole about programs they did in the 70s. It's not new. And um, it, this stuff is going on all over the world. When I was in Germany, we went to Zugspitz, the highest point in Germany, and I videotaped planes spraying jet contrails. I call them jet contrails that create, <coughs> persistent jet contrails that create clouds, because the Air Force calls chemtrails a conspiracy. And I don't want to get put in the camp of conspiracy because I deal in facts. When I do a speech, I, I want to make sure that my facts are right. So thank you so much. And I, I have a letter that um, lists a lot of the, the things that I'm concerned about and um, want to congratulate you for what you're doing. And I hope you do carry it further. And I hope we can spread this into Connecticut, into Texas, into all of the United States and get awareness of what's really being done. Thank you. Thank you for Hi, I'm Greg Fisher. I'm here in my role as a director for Americans for Legal Reform. Um, my point is really short. Uh, I'm going to put a uh, material safety data, data sheet into the record uh, for aluminum oxide. Aluminum oxide is a known skin and eye irritant. Uh, I'll just speak it up right there. We're going to be spraying uh, irritants into our airspace. Uh, also, uh, it's worse than that. Actually, uh, I'm going to uh, also submit a study from the American Thoracic Association, which uh, links aluminum oxide particulates to uh, uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Just in short, uh, uh, I incorporate what, uh, what prior speakers said. Uh, there is uh, significant health risk from inhaling uh, aluminum compounds. And, uh, and uh, Americans for Legal Reform supports this legislation wholeheartedly. Thank you. Thank you. This piece of legislation is absolutely necessary. And it is also necessary that we not forget the Constitution. And in the Constitution, it does mention promoting the general welfare and this is in violation of that uh, with all of the spraying that's going on. Uh, also, we have to keep in mind the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution, which says that all powers not given to the federal government of the states resides with the states and the people. And the Tenth Amendment has not been used enough. And I would want New York State to do more of what Arizona 
and Texas has already done, and that is to claim uh, state sovereignty over those powers that are clearly in the Constitution. What we have now is that the Constitution itself seems to be something that the federal government sees as inconvenient. <laughs> uh, let's take a look at the Fourth Amendment. And when you look at the Fourth Amendment, it's being eviscerated by Homeland Security. So when I speak about spraying, I do want to remind you that if somebody's a little too articulate and has too many facts, they can be deemed an enemy of the state where there is no evidence of violence, threat of violence, or desire of violence, but somebody who might get in the way of either the military or corporate profits in the public interest of health. Now, I would like for you to keep in mind that when you take a look at the name of chemical compounds, keep in mind three metals and three non-metals. The three metals is you have aluminum, barium, and strontium. Okay? Um, now, when it comes to the non-metals, you're going to have the um, you're going to have the the sulfides, the um, <clears throat> the chlorides, and the fluorides, the chlorides, the sulfides. Now, the thing is that you can have an enormous number of chemical compounds that has any one or more of those. But the result is, and I brought in the evidence here, if you ever want copies of this, it's fine. Um, one of them deals with carcinogens raising the cancer rates. And the other one deals with lowering the fertility rates. The way the fertility rates have been lowered and it was first discovered with frogs, and then it started to show up in terms of statistics involving people, is that first there's the obvious one, are lower sperm counts, but then was something less obvious, and that was the issue of women's eggs not being receptive. And that is where, well, what is normal is that the first sperm is accepted and all others are rejected. But the first sperm is now being rejected as all other sperm, and this means infertility inflicted on the woman. And what you find is that this coincides with higher rates of having um, chemical compounds ending up in the air and then percolating down into the ground every time it rains into the aquifer. And therefore, it mixes with drinking water. So you're either breathing it or you're ingesting it. And what are the what are the three items you have? Um, you have aluminum, you have barium and strontium. Then you have on the non-metal side, you have chlorination, the fluorination, and and the sulfides. And when you put all that together, we are having virtual a chemical attack on us by our own government. Now why would they do that? There's a number of reasons. First, um, where people on their deathbed have been, uh, have let things out because they didn't like holding in what they had to, signing these confidentiality agreements. And these are not confidentiality agreements, confidentiality agreements in order to protect the name of our agents overseas. And I want to keep secrecy of our names of our agents overseas until they get home. But what we're talking about here is secrecy over what is done that affects health. So the military not knowing the health consequences is using us as guinea pigs. Then you have something else. You have contracts between the government and private industry. And if it's good for corporate profits and dangerous for our health, what happens? <laughs> we, we see what happens. Beautiful. And next is, I'm not certain of this name because of the writing, is it Dave Handel? Yeah. Does that sound right? Or Haxtell? I can't tell what it says. Handel. Yeah, that's correct, Handel. Dave Handel? Handel. Handel. Yeah. Okay, you're next. <laughs> the aluminum and everything fogged my brain. Go ahead, Mr. Cohen. My name is Harold Cohen, and uh, I represent myself, but I'm also an independent researcher. Um, I'd like to put it into uh, the record. I have a lot more. I bring the trunk here. 
Uh, the first thing is documentation. Uh, this dating back, uh, actually originally started in 2009. Uh, this, this is a, uh, a letter, a document to Representative Steve Israel, which started in January 7 in 2010, and then was revised in 20, uh, February 2010. Uh, I gave this to Steve Israel's office, finally he acted on it, and he gave it to the FAA, basically the U.S. Department of Transportation, Federal Aviation Administration. It's interesting, they responded on February 7th of 2011, one year later. One, they denied uh, what I was stated, you can see the details in here. Second, what I find interesting is that they refer to a UN organization called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, okay, um, which is which is a joke. Um, the self-proclaimed experts, when they're really not. Uh, to counter that, I'm going to give you a document, which is a two years of research uh, on the IPCC, and this was done by Donner Lafamboise. There's two years of research on this. Uh, the title of her book is The Delinquent Teenager Who Was Mistaken for the World's Top Climate Expert. Basically, because of limited time, I guess we'll give you a synopsis of it. Uh, basically, in her quest for getting the truth, she found out the final following findings about the IPCC. The authors are frequently not reputable scientists at all, but graduate students. The sources that they cited in IPCC documents are frequently from radical green groups, not objective scientists. The IPCC routinely censors scientists who do not agree with the current global warming hysteria about greenhouse gases. Incidentally, CO2 comprises only 1% of the atmosphere and is not a pollutant, not like your, your fumes from a car. Um, the IPCC pursuing a leftist globalist political agenda and not a scientific one. The peer review process used in determining what articles get published by the IPCC is a charade. Only radical green viewpoints get favorable treatment. The IPCC seeks out articles with predetermined conclusions that fit the IPCC agenda. I can provide a lot more data than just this little summary uh, on this, on how they basically throw away data just to get their to make the viewpoint that they want. Okay? Um, can I give this to I have photographs from here which are documented. Um, I want to thank all of you for, uh, uh, for your efforts in, in the IR 2029 to establish that as a necessary legislation, preserve our health, our environment, our water and food supplies. Um, the bottom line, what it boils down to is this. Who is more important? Corporations, private interests, or the people? Also, all of us and you, all of you, are affected by this brain. Um, let me get into some other things. What are the origins of the chemtrails? The origins of uh, chemtrails was original purpose was for warfare, that is weather control. If you control the weather, you have an advantage against the enemy, right? As time went on, you had a development of nanoparticles. Nanoparticles are basically particles that are, particles that are a billionth of a meter. Very small, you need a microscope to see them on the high power, okay? Uh, and nanoparticles of different of the same substances versus grains versus nanoparticles will act differently and also in their absorption into the body. They can be breathed in very much more easily. They are absorbed in your cells and your organs. Then they contain viruses, bacteria, <coughs> fungi, etc. Uh, and basically, also was originally used for biological warfare, you know, for, for warfare purposes. They may also something else as time went on. You have very more than micro-miniaturized electronics. Now, I guess you have you've heard the term RFID or RFID chips, radio frequency ID chips, right? They also may con contain micro really miniaturized versions of RFID chips and very small, very small structure, and that can be used for tracking individuals. That's good for warfare purposes too. You can try the original purpose is to track your enemy where they are remotely. And also, could, unfortunately, could be also be used for tracking populations here on Earth. Um, there's a film, uh, which I'll make available for all of you if you want it. Uh, it's a non-copyrighted and freely can be freely copied. Uh, what in the world are they spraying? I don't know if any of you. Have heard of
You're done, Mr. Cohn. You're done. Thank you. I'm done. You're done. Now no, you have five minutes. All right, just one more thing. Look up. No, that's it. That's it. You're done. You're done. Dan Harder. I'm Dave Candell, and um, I, uh, for years actually I've been wanting something like this to uh, actually take place. And actually my uh, experience with uh, this geoengineering happened uh, about four years ago. I was walking through a beautiful Nassau, uh, Suffolk County Park, Condre Hall. And uh, no, I'm sorry, it was actually uh, Comset State Park. And the gentleman handed me a paper, all kinds of conspiracy theories, and I thought, what is this nonsense? I was ready to throw it out like it was garbage. And I started reading about geoengineering and chemtrails. I was like, this is nonsense. And I started paying more attention to the clouds and everything. And I saw sometimes days would go by, there would be just normal clouds. And all of a sudden, you have three days. Now, the planes are always flying. They, they fly around stuff, around the clock, because, you know, we're in New York. We're near a couple airports. Obviously, there's Iceland, MacArthur, there's LaGuardia, and there's Kennedy. So planes are flying around the clock. And you'd have three or four days where you would see just normal weather. Then all of a sudden you'd look up and you'd see, and these and planes at that altitude, obviously um, um, the weather doesn't change much at the 35,000 feet. All of a sudden you'd see lines like, and they would start spreading, and I'd be like, what is this? This is obviously not normal. And I started believing what I was reading. I was, I'd was, i start observing. I'd tell people, I'd say, you're crazy. They're not doing anything with the weather. I, it just was bizarre, you know? And um, <laughs> if you have four or five days, and all of a sudden you start seeing lines, and then it starts dispersing. And one of the really clear signs of the chemtrails is when you see the line, and all of a sudden it stops, then it turns back on again. Now, if a plane was flying, and you stopped seeing the contrail, does that mean the plane, the engine stopped combusting, and the engine's gonna collapse? <laughs> all of a sudden, what do we do? Turn back on the spray jets when they have to reload the canisters. I mean, that's pretty clear because a normal contra on a plane would have to constantly be going and they usually disperse in 10 minutes. So anyhow, to make a long story short, I've been telling everybody in for about three or four years. So the fact that I could actually speak my mind among like-minded people that didn't think I was crazy, just kind of, was, this is like awesome. And it, actually, I also saw that there's a $2,500 fine. Now, I don't know how you can actually fine them. That's just like, of throwing a penny out of your window in your car, a $2,500 fine. It should be like a million dollar fine. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> joke, that a $2,500 fine, it should be raised to like the, at least a million dollars. And uh, you know, you just look around and you see the weather. I tell them what type of time, but that's my two cents. And also, I'm kind of embarrassed to be an American to see that they're doing this. Yeah. 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 My mom actually came from Nazi Germany, and uh, my grandfather's in a concentration camp, and you know, she's 90, and she wouldn't believe that they're spraying us because she loves this country, but the fact that matter of seeing what's going on, it's kind of a shame to be an American and see what's going on. It's kind of horrendous, you know. Thank you, Thank you very much for everybody having me. members of the legislature. Thank you very much. I only say this to address you perhaps in one minute. And what I want to say is I cannot dispute what they're saying. As little as I know, I cannot add to what they've said. But I want to give something in the way of history. I want to bring up something that this legislative body, a tremendous role they played many years ago. So I ask you to just follow me for one second. The Battle of Spring the battle against the spraying of things in our atmosphere is not new. In 1967, right here in Suffolk County, a tremendous battle took place with the Environmental Defense Fund. It was the very first environmental group in this country, formed by scientists that lived right here in Suffolk County, possible neighbors of yours. And they came forward and they said to the council here, to the legislature, say, listen, there's something wrong with DDT. There's something wrong with the spraying of DDT. And not only the mosquitoes get killed, but you're killing just about everything else. It got in the water, it got into the air, it has a long half-life, you couldn't get rid of it. There are questions whether or not it causes cancer, and it's by no means that possibly it's linked to breast cancer, of which South County has a very high incidence on a nationwide level. 
But the bottom line is that this legislative body acted. They agreed with the EDF, they acted on it. Within a matter of years, DDT was banned from the United States entirely. Entirely, gone. <laughs> Within several years, the Nixon administration, following what took place right here in Riverhead, formed the Environmental Protection Agency, the very first body of its kind to monitor the safety of our environment, the very first of its kind. In 1970, the Clean Air Act followed by the Clean Water Act, enormous legislative moves for the protection of people by their representatives. So what they're asking, what everybody's asking, is that ask yourself the question, we all share the same air, we drink the same waters, we walk the same streets, parks, go boating, play tennis, whatever, we live here together. Possibly right here, you, the representatives today, 2011, 2012, Maybe you can make that same historic movement that will move right to the national level, the White House. Yeah. 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 So we got Mr. followed by, looks like Penny. I don't know, Penny some. Yeah, Harry Finkelstein, I should have been a doctor, I write like Go ahead. Uh, many of us uh, have heard the ads on the radio of late, see something, say something. see <laughs> <laughs> something, and we have a long time waiting to say something. Yeah. 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 I, I come from Ireland, you can probably tell my funny accent. It's not just over your county, it's over the entire globe. Something is going on. Uh, in, in the farmhouse in Ireland where I lived, no airports for hundreds of miles. It's not exactly, you know, a, a, a big airplane country, a little tiny island. There's just as many operations going on over there as there is right over Long Island. Uh, I'm down from Connecticut, and it's crazy up there too. Um, the trees are all dying, the, the spruces. It's, it's absolutely absurd. Um, now, the question I kind of have, if you propose a ban, and I hope you will, um, you know, a ban on the, the weather-altering chemicals, how do you propose to enforce the law? Because remember, in the aftermath of September 11th, um, it was 9-11, in which aircraft were used as a weapon, um, you know, we saw what can happen. We all need to be more observant of our sky. Uh, altering our local climate with chemical, chemical cloud seeding, etc., without our consent, is an act of bio warfare. Yep. Our future generations yeah. will depend on you making a decision here to ban the spray. Um, you have, we, you know, on the streets we have police that patrol that to make sure we don't go speeding. We have OSHA on the work sites. We have. You know, we've got all sorts of agencies, but who's going to control these planes if it's a black off? Who knows where it's funded from? And it appears it is. It may be not American, it's internationally funded. You have to consider that. And you've got a lot of evidence from people tonight. You can look through what they've given you here. Um, can you incorporate, perhaps, in your ban proposal, an in flight intercept? Wow. Based by whatever agency to take down for examination of these aircraft. Yes. Yeah. 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 Somebody has to start doing this, and but either get special agents, which I would like you to also have civilian, um, non-related agencies involved with them. Uh, we need to basically get some agencies that can, short of shooting them down, do something else <laughs> urgently. <laughs> And in fact, if necessary, in their unmarked aircraft, get the U.S. guard to shoot them down. Shoot them down! Shoot them down! Shoot them down! Shoot them down. We don't like to encourage this, but in the after events of 9 11, 2001, aircraft were used as a weapon on this country. It's happening again. That's all I have to say. Thank you. It's followed by Christy McKay. Good afternoon. I'll be brief. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, Legislator Romaine for bringing this vital issue into the light. Um, my name is Perry Finkelstein. I stand here and represent myself as well as the voices of my children. And I'd like to say my potential future grandchildren, but um, I don't even know if that's uh, going to happen because of where, where our health and well-being is being threatened at this very moment. 
This is a this is a global issue. It's not just happening here. I mean, a lot of evidence been, has been presented. It's it's, it's indisputable, and um, you know, everyone here. It's not it's not us versus you. We all breathe the same air. We all drink the same water. Our children play in the same playgrounds, and this is an opportunity for you esteemed folks to to make a make this date. A date that everyone remembers, not just here, not just another hearing day in Suffolk County. We are Suffolk County, Long Island, New York, and, and this could be a stand that, that goes global and it could make a huge difference. This is happening. This is, there's no debate. This is happening. We are being poisoned. We're being killed. We're being exterminated. It's happening. Okay? There's, there's no dispute. So, we're all part of the same community here. It's not us versus you guys. It's not. You know, so. so you know, I'm asking here for my children, for your children, for future generations to, to look at this and to, to make a stand and to make right what needs to be done. You know, I, I, I sit and watch up for, for decades already. I could watch a beautiful, clear blue sky go from a beautiful, sunny sky to hazy, toxic pollutants, you know, and I feel it. I sense it. I know it. So there has been no accountability. There's been no transparency and it needs to happen it needs to happen now we don't have time we are right. running out of time it's the one percent that is making these decisions okay so look right children <laughs> yourself okay look up in the sky this is no joke so the Shishindi people of this country the also known as the Apache have a saying Kadish day that means all is made beautiful so I implore you okay let's make it beautiful again we have the power you have the power please how much Christy McKay, followed by John Martel. Christy McKay. Oh, Christy McKay. How about John Martell? legislature today for hearing the public and I'm going to get into the definition of what you might not be familiar with what is a chemtrail and what is a contrail I don't expect you to be familiar with this we are well rehearsed we have researched this so I'll make it very simple and very clear when you see a plane in the sky and it leaves a contrail c-o-n-t-r-a-i-l that is the exhaust from the plane that exhaust dissipates in about 15 minutes. When you see a chemical trail, that trail does not dissipate in 15 minutes. If you watch that trail, it becomes more defined. And if you continue to watch that trail, it will overlap and twist in on itself. And then within an hour or two hours, it will expand across the horizon. And within due time, those toxins will float down to the earth and contaminate the earth. I'd like to bring your attention to the date of February 20th of 2010, an event that took place in San Diego. The American Association for the Advancement of Science had a meeting regarding geoengineering. During that meeting, a person from the audience, a concerned person who was well aware of chemtrails and their toxins, had asked David Keith who is a proponent and a supporter and an advocate of geoengineering, a very important question. The millions of tons of toxic barium and aluminum that's being dumped into the atmosphere that transcends down to the earth, he asked David Keith if this is at all a threat to humankind. And I'm going to quote for you exactly what David Keith, a proponent, and supporter and advocate of geoengineering said on February 20th of 2010, and I quote, we haven't done anything serious on Illumina, and there could be something terrible that we find tomorrow that we have not looked at, quote unquote. I'm gonna continue on because we are pressed for time. I have brought some documentation. I have a 10-page document here that's entitled Air Force 
Research Laboratory in vitro toxicity of aluminum nanoparticles in rats. Oh now, anybody who knows anything about the human species and rats, rats are used and scientifically accepted as an element of our world, and what is bad for the rat is bad for the humans. This 10-page document, moving along to the end of the page, the conclusion is, and I quote, Aluminum oxide nanoparticles displayed significant toxicity after 96 and 144 hours post-exposure. And I will be submitting this document to the board uh, after I talk. Another thing that I would like to bring up regarding documentation, a very interesting 42-page documentation. This documentation is entitled, Weather as a Force Multiplier, Owning the Weather in 2025, a research paper presented to the Air Force. And this research paper was done by Colonel Tammy J. House, Lieutenant Colonel James B. Near, Major Ann Mercer, and Major James E. Pug. I will go to page 27 of this document, and going down to the last paragraph, the paragraph states, nanotechnology also offers possibilities for creating simulated weather, a cloud or several clouds of microscopic computer particles all communicating with each other and with a large control system could provide tremendous capabilities. Interconnected, atmospherically buoyant, and having navigation capabilities in three dimensions, such clouds could be designed to have wide range elements within our skies. In closing, I would like to say Please remember the world you are now seeing. There will be counterclaims within the evidence that will be presented in and around the claims of what is commonly known today as chemtrails. You will be told that all is normal and as it should be. You will be told that there is nothing to be concerned about and that everything is always as it always has been. Your eyewitnesses accounts will be dismissed as unreliable. This dismissal by acclaimed authorities, well you get the picture. <laughs> By John Hello, thank you very much. Um, I am here in the capacity of uh, president of Empire State Lyme Disease Association. I don't blame anyone up there or in the audience for doubting the uh, veracity of the claims about geoengineering of our skies. Six years ago, a friend told me to investigate chemtrails. This friend is intelligent, well-informed, and very accomplished. Yet she left it to me to look up in the sky to do my own research. Even though I respect my friend, I did try to dismiss her chemtrail claims. Two years ago, um, I did become convinced that we do have a problem. I saw chemtrails in Denver, Colorado, and I saw them in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and I've seen them here. And they don't just fly every day, they fly every day and every night. There are many connections that have been made. Huge corporations such as Novartis, which is based in Germany, have bought American companies. For example, Beechnut Baby Foods and the American Seed Company. Are they connected to this geoengineering of our skies? Is our government or parts of our government connected or other groups? I leave it to others to answer these questions. I see planes flying which deliberately seem to be creating patterns in the sky above us, as you've heard over and over, sorry. But they make plants, they crisscross, and they slowly dissipate and form a cloud cover which in effect obliterates the sun. So many of us are just too busy and I've been too uh, overwhelmed with concerns of Lyme patients to really pay much attention. So I, it's understandable that if you're not looking for something, even if it's the elephant in the living room, you're not going to see it. Exactly. Just as my friend told me years ago, don't believe me, just look it up and look up in the sky. I have two questions. Number one, if these trails were only contrails or water vapor, 
or if they used the same fuel used by sky riding planes, the trails would dissipate quietly and leave no effect on our sky. So they, they, are they co just contrails like the disbelievers would have you believe? Number two, if normal, typical planes can fly without leaving any trails, I may be oversimplifying, but why not also make it a law that all planes use the less offensive fuel? Health-wise, vitamin D deficiency is real. Lyme patients may in fact be a group of the population who may be the most seriously impacted. It is depressing to suffer from tick-borne diseases and, and a lack of blue skies, beautiful sunsets, and sunrises. Sunrises, that doesn't help Lyme patients or anyone. If someone, as I do believe now, if someone is, or at least they do have the capacity of adding harmful chemicals, etc., to their chemtrails, Lyme patients are not healthy enough to withstand this kind of barrage for long. As for who is responsible for this, I don't believe it is our total U.S. government or any other country's total government. And I also doubt if it is all corporations, but we do need to find out who they are and we do need to stop them. The IR 2029 is a really good beginning and I thank you very much and especially everyone.